Hello and welcome to the RAS Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rasc.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. This is our weekly two cents segment. I'm Pete Wargen from Alan Wargen Property Buyers. and I'm here with Chris Bates from the Flint Group. Basie, how's your ankle today? I heard you had a bit of an injury. Oh, I'm feeling a bit sorry for myself and um, it was pretty uh, horrible coming home at 9 o'clock last night, driving with my left foot, um, calling my wife on the way and saying, oh man, I'm in pain, um, can you get the drugs ready? Um, so yeah, nah, I uh, thought I was killing it, you know, 500 days with my health kick yesterday as well, which was a coincidence. So I'm like, yep, this is going good and then bang. Life teaches you a lesson, right? Uh, tried to turn at full pace the other direction and uh, the good old 37-year-old ankle decided to to give way on me. Um, excruciating pain. So uh, I'm sure it's not as bad as it felt, but um, like man flu, men like to whinge about their injuries. So yeah, my poor wife was running around crazy after the kids this morning and I'm just uh, my foot up on the couch. So how are you doing, Pete? How's life going there? I thought, bad. I, did, I actually completely forgot that you're 37. It makes me feel old. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the break. Oh, I've, I've done my ankle multiple times. It's probably my most feared injury. It's absolutely horrible. So, uh, yeah, get get an ice pack on it and rest for a week or two because you don't want to make it weaker for the future. Yeah, I've been real busy. I uh, flew from Perth to London this week. Uh, first Rare. time I've ever done that 17 and a half hours direct flight with All Pontus. All right, yep. Good. Which was pretty good, to be honest. I, I'd actually do it again. I think it's better if you can, to, rather than mucking around with a few hours here and a few hours there, just just get it done, bang. And uh, it was it was pretty good. The kids slept uh, for a decent chunk of the way. Uh, Western Australia was great, really interesting. A um, few surprising things I saw over there. And then we've had budget night this week. So, yeah, it, uh, sort of did a live webinar for the budget, which was pretty good and uh, got new book out next week so that's keeping me busy uh, Kate Bakos and I have co-authored a book the buy right uh, approach to property investing so keep an eye out for that one in the airport bookstores if you're traveling or at Dimex or Amazon or wherever you're looking so yeah all of that stuff yeah not much downtime this week yeah looking forward to trying one of those um project sunrise on Qantas right um you know there's been a lot of talk over the years uh I mean I was before my time um, what was those? Uh, the Concords, was it? The Concords, mm. the, the, the fast ones. Where you just wonder in the future how air transport's going to change, right? You know, you've got the drones flying around our Sydney, the Uber Air. You know, there's apparently trials happening around the world. Uh, but also, is international travel going to get faster, cheaper, easier, you know, with electricity, et cetera? I, I am fascinated by that. So it's interesting you've done that, that leg, Earth to. Uh, London, was there any major changes in terms of the way that you're on the plane in terms of, uh, was it more leg room? Did they do anything else that sort of made that journey a little bit more comfortable or was it just the same thing sitting sitting cattle parts? Uh, not really, yeah. So, yeah, with kids, we fly economy. It's a bit wasted to go premium Absolutely. or business with children. Uh, also, the vegetarian food's not great for veggies like us, but, um, yeah, otherwise it's more or less the same. Uh, the reason yeah. we did it, we used to fly with a different airline, uh, one of the Asian ones. But I guess with COVID and cutbacks and so on, the prices have been sky high. The service not been great. So Qantas are doing these uh, round-the-world tickets. Worth checking out. This is not a sponsored uh, piece, by the way. <laughs> it's just uh, It was just something that we came across when shopping around. We saw the international airfares were coming down a bit. And we've got, I think it's five stops with a round-the-world ticket. And it's pretty good value. So we've got London... Uh, to Boston, Massachusetts, and then LA, and then one other stop, which will probably be, I don't know, Hawaii if uh, my wife gets her way, and then back to Brisbane. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's worth checking out if you're looking at um, international flights because, yeah, some of them have been crazy expensive the last year or two, and it's nice to see see them coming back down to earth. So, yeah, it's on the cost of living theme then, Chris. That's going to be one of our stories this week because it's been budget week, which always gets a lot of interest in Australia. It seems to get more more interest than probably it would see in a lot of other countries. So that's one of the things we'll look at. The budget bringing some cost of living relief. Then we've got a second story, a couple of pieces actually 
um, in the AFR with the housing market um, construction competing for resources with infrastructure is a real challenge. The government uh, knows we need more housing, but there wasn't really much in the budget as to how that's going to be achieved. And there's just not really enough resources around at the moment to see that construction happen. And then thirdly, a um, couple of stories um, around Melbourne, what's been going on down there. A bit of a listings increase for Melbourne and it's dampening housing prices. But Stuart Weems, good friend of the show, uh, from Pro Solution Private Clients, predicts that Melbourne will be the best performing housing market over the next decade. He likes to take a contrarian view, does Stuart, and um, he's been proven right before, actually, with uh, similarly contrarian view. So we'll take a look at that as well. So um, did you watch the budget, Chris? How did you go with that? Oh, I didn't watch it, to be honest. I had to actually do some Trust work. Me. And uh, my wife will hate me saying this, but she was watching a bit of Farmers uh, Once a Wife. So uh, I was working in the background. But uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully she never hears that. But anyway, um, <laughs> the budget was pretty disappointing, right? So I did read the headlines. I did sort of get the points. I mean, we spoke about this for months leading up into this. And um, it was just a little bit lackluster around the property market. I think it was a bit tame. I think it was, you know, a bit safe. It wasn't brave enough. And when you have got a rental crisis, you've got a housing affordability crisis, your mortgage holders are in a lot of stress, um, you know, a lot of uncertainty uh, for how first home buyers are going to enter the market and, and how they're going to afford to save with the rental crisis. And, you know, maybe there was a tiny little bit of, we're going to put a bit of money into, um, you know, it's just, you know, uh, housing affordability in terms of uh, social housing and things like that. But there, you know, those numbers, when you think about the property market, it's worth 11 trillion. Throwing 10, 20 billion into the market. Yeah, it looks great when the number of properties, but it doesn't really move the needle for the mass market. And um, yeah, I thought it was a bit tame, to be honest. What was your thoughts, Pete? Oh, for housing, definitely. Yeah. So the, the, the thing that was always going to get the headlines cost of living relief for rent and for energy. So the Commonwealth rent assistance, about a million households qualify for a 10% increase there. And then every household, Gets three hundred dollars relief uh, for energy, so you can see why the government's done this. The basic idea is uh, the Reserve Bank was forecasting that the headline inflation wouldn't get back to the two to three percent target band until way into two thousand and twenty-five. And now the government is forecasting with Treasury the CPI will be under three percent by Christmas, so much faster. But it's a bit of a cheat because what they've really done here is um, effectively a handout. Um, so the way it's going to work, um, power price discounts, uh, $300 to every household. So no means testing. Everyone gets a car in the old uh, Oprah Winfrey way of putting it. Everyone gets a car, you get a car. So um, no, there's no means testing at all. Though. It's just across the board. And every small business should get $325 as well. So Chris, you might uh, get that in the new office maybe. But all of this is in addition to what the states have done already. So uh, state discounts, we had $1,000 for Queensland. There was 400 bucks for Victoria, 400 bucks for WA. I was thinking about it. There'll be plenty of people up north who've got no power price bills at all. I think by the time they've taken off the 1000 then another 300 uh, certainly a lot of the holiday homes around Noosa Springs um, don't use that much energy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, the skeptics would say, yeah, this is all well and good, but you're just reducing headline inflation. You're not really slowing underlying inflation. And arguably, you're just freeing up more cash to be spent elsewhere. But I see, like, my thinking of this is obviously it's an election play, right? The next election is 12 months away. They're hoping for an interest rate cut before the next election to help them get across the line. Um, and I think actually it could work. I think, um, you know, there's, they copped a lot of flack in the media, but a lot of Households have seen their mortgage repayments doubling in recent months. They've gone from, say, 2% mortgage rates and suddenly they're paying 6 I think that's going to slow down the economy a lot more than people think it is. Um, so I think it's not a bad gamble, really, by Chalmers, despite all the flack in the media. Um, my final point, Chris, on the housing uh, market, you're right. The implications there, there was it was very light touch, wasn't it? There, there was just a bit of... Bit of talk about streamlining and a bit of talk about social right. and affordable housing, but very, very small numbers in the context of huge immigration that we've got. I think the most um, the most of the chat was really about infrastructure, the Western Sydney, Sunshine Coast Rail Project, 
And I think the only real tangible change that they talked about was capping student numbers, unless yeah. the higher education facilities can provide more student accommodation. So that is a tangible change, I guess, if they can really yeah. put a bit of a cap on international student numbers. But overall, it was very light. I was expecting much more about the housing market, to be honest. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's a let's play it safe here. But I think in 12 months' time, are we going to still see a rental crisis? Absolutely. Investors are going to keep bailing, and, and particularly the investors are not going to reinvest where the investors are leaving. And that's a real shift to our rental stock. Um, you know, investors are selling out of, say, the housing market in our capital cities, all the unit markets in our capital cities. And a lot of investors are going regionally because of borrowing capacity because they don't want to buy apartments, and they're going there because there's a lot of uh, noise around that type of investment property right now, I would say. And so, uh, and a lot of new entrants, a lot of new businesses that are, you know, buyers agents that buy these, you know, in the more regional areas. And so, the, a lot of rental stops getting created there, but a lot leaving our capital cities. And so, 12 months' time, I can see the rental crisis actually getting worse, not better. And uh, if rates are still high, well, mortgage holders are still feeling a lot of pain. A lot of first home buyers can't either save or enter the market because borrowing capacity is still really tight. And so, you know, the problem's not going to go away. And, uh, you know, going into the next election, maybe that's the, they come out with a bigger budget prior to that and then try to win all the votes going into the next election with how much they're going to help first home buyers and um, et cetera. So maybe it was just to play it safe this year, like you say, get inflation under control. And then, um, you know, make some big policies going into the election next year to try to try to win another um, term. Yeah, we really don't know what's going to happen with inflation. It, it's interesting. There's definitely a present uh, bias here or recency bias. I think people have got into their heads that inflation's been high and therefore it will always be high. We'll never get it under control. But, you know, you've got to remember we had five or six years where inflation was under 2%. And I think it's um, a lot of this has been driven by an unprecedented um, uh, series of lockdowns and stimulus measures. But um, yeah, in the US, um, just as we speak, uh, overnight inflation was a bit softer than expected there. Um, Australia saw the wage price figures this quarter were a bit softer again, softer than market expectations. I think things are generally moving in the right direction. I think um, Labour will be hoping, yeah, an interest rate cut before the next election, or if not, they can at least say, well, hey, look, we've taken some of the cost of living pressures away from you. Uh, but yeah, actually, interestingly, uh, spending was pretty high. If you look out uh, 2025, 26, 27, 28, well, payments as a percentage of GDP are going up. So um, normally in Australian budgets, you would expect to see um, government's net debt coming down, but it's actually just going to rise and rise and rise and rise in the years to come. I mean, in the context of Australia having a pretty low government debt, certainly compared to a lot of other developed countries. But it's pretty interesting, uh, really, splashing a bit of cash around. There is a lot of wastage in Australia, but that's a bit off topic for today. I think um, you know, overall for the housing market, there just wasn't that much in there. I was expecting much more talk about build to rent, but that sort of uh, I think the interest is cooled there a little bit, uh, probably because a lot of international developers would say, well, hell, I can, I can get a risk-free return of 4 or 5%. Why would I bother going into build to rent for returns of a bit more? It's probably not worth the effort. Yeah, and I think you um the infrastructure is an interesting conversation because that leads us into story number two, right? Um, there's not really a lack of infrastructure investment, and infrastructure takes a long, long time to to work its way through roads, trains, you know, etc. They don't just go up in uh, a year or so. So. What's your take on that, Pete? Because that really leads into story number two. Yeah, it was actually, there were two stories actually by the guys at the Finn. And yeah. so Larry and Michael both did pieces, which were slightly different, but with similar uh, themes, I suppose. So yes, we've got cuts to student numbers coming, but overall population growth is still high. And that requires a lot of housing and a lot of infrastructure at the same time. And I think um, some of these infrastructure blowouts and delays and overruns, um, and there's just been massive investment in infrastructure, which was kind of needed to bridge that gap through the pandemic, but that's just pushed up construction costs. So the whole uh, development cycle for high-rise housing, which should have really kicked off, has just been pushed out. It's been delayed 
by a year. One of the measures actually in the budget was um, the fast tracking of visas for 15,000 skilled construction workers and tradies. And that, that is one of the issues. There's just not, a, not been enough available people with the right skills. Um, but there's also been pressure on, on costs and materials. I think um, as a corollary or as an outcome of this, um, it, the, the Labour government's plan to build 1.2 million new homes by 2029, well, it's just not happening at the moment, is it? Um, so Larry's piece in the Fin Review said, uh, this is just a quote, cautious lenders are shunning larger or more affordable housing projects aimed at first-time buyers, and instead they're focusing only on funding smaller luxury developments with bigger profit margins. Basically, stuff's just not feasible uh, for the more, more affordable developments. Land prices are too high. Construction costs are too high. I think I read actually this uh, week that the construction costs for an apartment is about 650000 um, And if you include the land prices, you're, well, you're not really building a lot for much than a million dollars per unit now. So I think this is really what we've talked about in recent chats, Chris, is that there's certain areas where unit projects are getting up, basically places like the Gold Coast or Redcliffe and places like that where uh, the developers can sell units for a few million dollars because they've got ocean views and, and there's a lot of baby boomers, retirees who will be cash buyers and they're quite happy with that. But they're just it's just that middle ring suburban apartment block is just not making any sense at today's prices and they're just not getting built or financed. Yeah, I was chatting to a mate who's a broker in Melbourne and we're chatting about the North East Link and um, he's got a bunch of clients who are working on that project and, um, you know, his comment was that the salaries they're getting paid, paid are just way higher than, you know, other projects out there. It's just a real lack of workers, right? And so how can a residential developer compete for the same you know, talent to, to help them build, right? When the government's splashing a lot of money on that North East Link, for example. And I think that lot's happening up in Brisbane, Pete, with the Olympics. What are you seeing up there? <laughs> yeah, this is a, just a silly anecdote for you, but uh, just a week or two ago, or maybe three weeks ago, um, I was just in Noosa Civic there, and there was a news story that was flashed up on one of the screens there about uh, lollipop workers. Is that what they still call them these days? You know, the people who flip the signs around. And getting paid the best part of a quarter of a million bucks on some projects um, on infrastructure and FIFO workers and so on. I mean, it's uh, it's one of those silly stories. But I think um, look, there's, there's a lot of pressure from the construction unions in Queensland to push for huge pay increases from uh, the next financial year. So whether or not they get those across the line, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, the, there's the same issues. Um, there is just a phenomenal amount of stuff going on around places like Ipswich, south of Ipswich, Caboolture. Um, the housing supply is no way keeping up with the demand in that part of the country. Infrastructure, yes, Cross River Rail's happening. Uh, there's all of the stuff with the Olympics to come. There's just so much going on, roads, sewerage. Um, yeah, and it's, it's difficult to find the people, really, um, the, and, and not, not least the resources. And, yeah, construction costs are up. Um, yeah, for infrastructure, they're probably up 40%. For housing, up 50% since pre-pandemic. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the, I suppose, unintended consequences of the lockdowns and all the infrastructure spending that was put in place. And in a lot of states, people are getting fed up because of the overruns, especially in Victoria. A lot of projects seem to get talked about but never seem to get finalised or delivered. Um, so, yeah, a lot of challenges there. I think things are... But normalizing somewhat, but it's a bit of a way to go. Yeah, and I mean, even in New, nah, New South Wales and Sydney, you've got the Metro West, you've got the Metro Southwest that's starting to get close to be finished. You've got all the Warringah Freeway and the Second Harbour crossing. You've got the gateway around um, Sydney Airport. You've got Western Sydney Airport. You've got Western Sydney Metro. You've got, you know, the list goes on, right? Upgrading to our trains up to Newcastle. Um, got the F6 down towards um, uh, the Shire, stage one's getting done down there. There's probably plenty I've missed out. Yeah, the government canned a few projects, like where I am up to the beaches. Um, that got cut pretty quick uh, uh, in the in the last uh, election. But um, yeah, I mean, I think there's just an enormous amount of infrastructure that's happening. And um, yeah, they've, they've slowed it down, but there's just a lot, you know, we're talking a good decade worth of work, I would say, 
still to come. And so it's going to make it really hard for us to pick up the slack here in the housing market and start to build what we need to to match our migration, but also our pent up demand and demographics. I think if we we think about it, um, there's a lot of people who are renting that want to enter the market who wish they entered three, year, four years ago, or they they want to upgrade, get out of the parent time, or they want to upgrade from an apartment to a townhouse. They're stuck, right? So as soon as they can afford to do it, they want to enter the market. Plus, as years tick over, right, more and more people, you know, get older, they couple up, they want to have families and they want to upgrade or they want to enter the market. And, you know, Bernard Salt's very good at sort of, um, you know, if you want to follow demographics, it's just understanding how the, the future demand of the property market with demographics, let alone migration. And um, then you look at the other end of the scale, you know, around the older generation and all their challenges around downsizing and age care and, uh, and how that's really slowing down um, the transaction of property. So, yeah, it's uh, another one to watch, but it's just not good news for uh, supply of new property in Australia. It's uh, when we've got these competing interests for talent. So let's go to story number three, Pete. What are, what are we what are we doing? There's just one other part to that second story that I'll just throw in before we move on. Mm. Uh, yeah, Sunshine Coast Project up to uh, uh, yep. the other back of the woods is going ahead. So uh, good news if you've uh, an investor in Maroochydore or places like that. It's long overdue, I should say. But um, yeah, just on that point, I was chatting to um, a chap this week who's um, he's living in Melbourne but born and bred in Malula Bar. We were just talking about all those projects around places like Maroochydore. They're just stalled. They, they're just not completing. There's a lot right. of stuff that has started in the housing market, units, apartments, townhouses, but they're just not being delivered. And I think there's a sort of subplot here, and that is the number of construction industry insolvencies over the past year. It's, it's over 2,300. Um, a year ago, well, that's up by 34% from a year ago, ASIC figures. So um, there's a bit of that going on. And yeah, we know the industry has a lot of phoenixing, and we did have a couple of years where insolvencies were low, but now we're at the highest in, what, 10, 12 years? Um, so there's a lot of construction projects that have stalled and there's not much confidence out there. I think the, the housing market when you, with construction and development and the cycle, confidence is a big thing. People need to believe that prices are moving in the right direction, projects can be delivered, and uh, confidence has been shattered at the moment. So, And a, a lot of projects just um, in a bit of a go slow. So, yeah, there's that. that there's another part of that, that whole story, I suppose. So... Yeah, let's um, go on to that third story then, Chris. So Melbourne listings deluge suppressing prices. That was a piece in macro business. So I think there's there's been a lot of things coming together at the moment just to hold back uh, Victoria. We've got lower wages growth than most other parts of the country. Government debt levels have kind of spiralled out of control and that's, been, that's sort of been parlayed into higher land taxes. We've got business numbers falling in Victoria. And in the housing market, listing numbers have suddenly picked up. Um, not very high, I suppose, overall, but new listings are rising and that's uh, just pushed down uh, housing prices. Well, in the, in the context of housing prices falling by 0.1% in a month, it's nothing, uh, nothing material, but other parts of the country obviously have seen prices rising, like Brisbane and, and Perth. Um, so I guess the uh, story that stood out to me, Stuart Weems from Pro Solution headline: Melbourne property will deliver the strongest growth over the next decade. And um, I think um, Stuart likes to take a contrarian view, and he he points out that in 2018 he wrote a compelling thesis on why Brisbane was the market poised for significant growth. And actually, uh, he's absolutely right. I think um, since then prices are up about 70 percent for houses in Brisbane. Uh, and at the time, that wasn't a popular view. So now he's really saying, look, there's negative sentiment around Victoria today, but if you look a decade out, there's, relatively speaking, better value in Melbourne suburbs, um, certainly cheaper compared to a lot of other cities um, versus historical averages, and also very high population growth projected over the next decade. So he thinks the fundamentals are pretty strong. It's just at the moment, everyone's got a downer on Victoria and Melbourne. Yeah, and I think that's a it's a good way to think about it when you are counter cyclical, right? You don't follow the herd, you sort of make a bet where everyone else isn't buying and hopefully you can be patient and you get ahead of the party. Um, that's usually when you get the best growth is early on in a boom rather than 
like people entering Perth now, have they missed the party, right? Are they entering at the last point and then you've got the growth uh, prospects are much more limited when you enter later. So I do agree with Stuart. Um, I'm probably a bit biased. I've got property down there myself and I've been wishing that sort of performed a little bit better. But ultimately, I do think the housing affordability down there is, is a much better bet, right? If you're saying staying in Melbourne versus moving to, you know, even Brisbane now versus it was 12 months ago, you're probably thinking, well, actually, there's not actually that much cheaper up there for what I want. Maybe I should just stay in uh, in Melbourne. So um, I do think, you know, Stuart's going to be right. I do think that the housing market in particular down there, not so much the units and apartment market, I do think uh, probably against what Stuart believes, maybe a little bit that, you know, he's a bit more of a fan of the apartments down there than I am. Um, but I do think that the housing market's got the right fundamentals. I do think that getting their mojo back is really hard down there and um, it does seem a little bit like negative uh, Nancy down there, right? You've, you've got this, uh, the, all the changes to the taxes, investors are bailing, which is actually not a bad thing for house price growth. It causes a rental crisis and when there's a rental crisis, it forces people to buy. Um, but I do think because the investors are bailing, you're creating a more listing. So the, the home buyers are going, well, it's all right. There's no pressure here. There's not this rise in prices. Um, and investors aren't saying holding on because they're going, well, if I hold on for another year, I'll get a better price next year. And so I do think it needs to flip into a positive feedback loop uh, and the news around Melbourne needs to get better. And then um, I do think you'll start to see a bit of FOMO and then that pushes up prices and listings go slower because people hold on. And um, But yeah, it hasn't got that same listings and rental crisis that other places in the country have got. I think that return to work you know, all the lockdowns down there and um, people desire to get back into the city. I think their occupancy rate um, versus what it was pre-COVID is, you know, a bit dire compared to other cities. And so, but you'd think Melbourne would get its mojo back. What's the, some of the benefits of living in Melbourne? The cafes, the restaurant, the city life, the sport, um, the vibe you get in the city. So I, I wouldn't bet against Melbourne in terms of global livability. Um, and do people, uh, does the population grow in the communities down there? Um, I reckon Melbourne's going to get its mojo back. And um, yeah, like Stuart says, in, 12, 12, in a decade's time, we're going to be like, oh yeah, maybe that was a good bet to buy there in 2024, counter cyclical to what everyone else was doing. It's a popular choice. Um, I think especially with families who want to get onto the housing ladder. And don't forget, Australia's immigration is now going to be largely driven by immigration from India. So, and a lot of Indian families will want to have a detached house. They don't mind being necessarily further from the CBD. I think, you know what, I was actually thinking this week, it's interesting to look back because um, I was chatting to Kate Bakos because we've been writing together with our new book. And I was looking back at some of the things I predicted, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago. And you look at, back at the stuff you get right and you give yourself a pat on the back, but there's loads of stuff uh, if you're honest, where I just didn't didn't predict things uh, as they've turned out. One of the things was um, I just never believed that houses in Western Sydney would achieve the million dollar price tags. I just didn't think that would happen in such a short time frame. I remember the houses in Penrith, you know, selling for 100k and stuff like that, or St Mary's or Mount Druid, and now there's people paying seven figures. So like, there, there's certain things I I didn't get right, and you could probably add Caboolture to the same list actually. I uh, just never thought the price, prices would get to where they have. But anyway, uh, my point being, um, Stuart makes a good point here about the differences between Sydney and Melbourne. Sydney's very constrained with geographical boundaries. You've got national parks, you've got um, the ocean to the east. Melbourne has got much more room to expand or spread out and accommodate increased population, as Stuart points out. So, um, And Stuart's view is um, that Generally, as the population grows, and Melbourne does grow quickly, uh, with congestion, travel times, um, poor amenities in some of the outer suburbs, he thinks they'll be somewhat less attractive to live. And he thinks the, the value is really in Melbourne's blue chip areas. Um, certainly good value when compared to prices in the outer suburbs. I would tend to agree. I think the outperformers will be the landlocked, desirable suburbs, um, maybe a bit closer in. I think, uh, yeah, I, I was interested when we did the Rask uh, Roadshow out of Wangaratta um, last year, just driving out to the very outer fringe of Melbourne. And gee whiz, there's some houses out there stuck with 
not much around them. There's just houses and then fields. Um, so, yeah, I think you, you do need to uh, think not just at the city level, but think about suburb level and property type and price point um, because, yeah, it's one thing to predict that the city will perform X, Y, and Z, but you do, in the end, only buy a, an individual asset most likely. Yeah, and I do think that the getting stuck in your home is going to start to become a real problem in Melbourne in terms of people would go, oh, well, I'll buy a starter house and I'll upgrade to a three, four bed house. And I think that that jump's going to be too big for a lot of families, you know, particularly as, like you say, the premium suburbs do outperform, particularly the bigger houses with the work from home. And, um, you know, that gap will be too big to, to make. And so what that'll do is it'll slow up listings and people will get stuck in their homes. And so, you know, like you see, you can easily see that up in um, in Sydney where people are, yeah, I'd love to upgrade, but I just can't do it. And so what I'm going to do is stay and renovate. And I think that's going to be uh, probably the transition for Melbourne is that people go, well, yeah, this is my forever home now. And yeah, I'd love to live maybe a bit closer down the Bayside or maybe I'd love to live a bit closer to the city, but I can't afford to make those jumps. And so the freezing up of the housing market, I think it's also going to get hard to rent houses down there because more and more investors aren't going to be able to afford to go into the Melbourne housing market. It's a slow death of renting a house down there. It's always been pretty easy to rent a house in Melbourne, in fairness. A lot of investors have played in that market at, um, versus the apartments down there. And so there hasn't been that rental pressure there, but that absolutely shifted a lot in the last couple of years. I think it will shift a lot in the next two or three years because most investors aren't going there. A lot of investors are bailing. Um, so every time an investor sells down there, it goes to a first home buyer, which is obviously great for that first home buyer, but it's not great for the renters um, or for people wanting to rent houses because now there's one less house for rent. And um, I think that rental crisis, oh, actually, maybe we can't afford to rent a house or maybe we won't be able to rent one with a rental crisis. Maybe we should buy that. You know, and I think that's absolutely what's happened in other cities. So yeah, let's let's see how that one plays out. I do love a good forecast. So good job to... Stuart, he's not a, he's not scared of making um big calls. To be honest, he's one of the ones who probably called the downturn in 2018, 2019 from memory. And also in COVID, he was uh, very vocal when the rest of the country would say, "Oh, we've got 20 percent falls." He was predicting um up. So when Stuart talks, a lot of people should listen. Yeah. So his point being really over the past three to five years, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, and to some extent Canberra have all had good performance, but Melbourne's underperformed relatively to them. And therefore, if you were to think um, think of it like a mean reversion or a quilt of returns, Melbourne's probably going to be due at some point over the next decade. Uh, just a, a little anecdote for you. I was just chatting to um, a few people off the record this week uh, about what's going on in Perth and um, just a bit of talk about some of the new buyer's agents in the industry um, sort of pumping up prices in certain suburbs because they're all targeting the same places it's, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy and um yeah there's there's a lot of FOMO going on I think in the Perth market at the moment and uh yeah I mean it's yeah, I, that's not really um uh, chasing quick gains is not really how I tend to think of the property market you're really looking to make 10-year decisions here or ideally 20 or 30-year decisions and not getting too caught up in uh the, the sort of uh, frenzy period of the cycle because um, when the tide goes out, uh, you might find that some of that demand was a bit artificial. So, yeah, just uh, be a little bit careful depending on where and what you're buying at the moment because some parts of the country are still pretty hot. Yeah, I guess a way to think about it is, uh, yeah, maybe you can uh, buy these markets, but when you really want to buy, kind of back to my last point, is that you want to get there before the party, right? And so if you're starting to enter now and, prices have already started to run and you want to just get that last half of the growth or even let's say and it, but it doesn't happen and it stops and usually what happens is there's a little bit of a top of a of a mountain right a lot of that last bit of um, hot air quickly evaporates and prices do come back a bit straight away because it overshoots and then it pulls back so let's just say you did get buy it right at the top or close to the top and then all of a sudden it pulled back and you've got stamp duty selling costs then you've got this kind of confirmation bias, like this sunk cost, loss aversion plays around. And then um, you decide to hold on and then bang, it actually convert, you know, corrects a little bit more. It doesn't grow, stabilizes. Then what you can do is you can get stuck. And what ends up happening is now you end up burning time. And what you, you go is, oh, maybe I should have been better to invest in this city over that city. And what ends up people, people do? 
is they just don't make a decision and they hold on and they just rent it out for 10 years and they just basically don't get any growth. And um, what they've really missed is the opportunity costs of potentially betting on more safer market that had better, stronger, longer term fundamentals. And they just don't invest because they just hold on to that property that they did a bit of speculation to try to um, make some money in the short term. And so that's where it goes wrong, right? And so I think that's what people should realize. The problem is it's hard to trade property. It's hard to trade in and out of markets. And you know, I don't really, not really a fan of that type of buyer's agent. Uh, it's great for them in fairness because they can do more transactions rather than buying one property you hold for 30 years. Buying uh, three properties, selling three properties, buying other three properties, um, you can see which is a better business model for a buyer's agent, right? So um, that's that's my concern there uh, and also one is if they get it wrong right and they're not gambling their money they're gambling your money and um you know it's really hard to call it right you get one roll does that just wipe out the growth and um it's not that simple what happens if you can't buy as well like people's situations change borrowing capacity changes and so you know that ability that opportunity to buy that investment property is wet as well so just be conscious that that belief that you're always going to be able to borrow and buy another investment property in the future is going to happen. I've seen that not work out as well. Quality over quantity has always been our uh, mantra, hasn't it? Because I think ever since yeah. we first met, I think we've always been on the same page there. So let's Absolutely. wrap it up for this week. So the budget 2024 will bring cost of living relief, but not really much in terms of housing market solutions. I think a lot of people are a bit disappointed with that. Um, secondly, um, well, the housing shortage is not going to be solved anytime over the next couple of years. Too much competition with infrastructure for resources. Uh, the AFR covered that this week. And thirdly, a bit of a listings deluge for Melbourne. That might be overplaying that uh, story a little bit. But um, yeah, Stuart Weems makes a good point there. Don't bet against the Melbourne comeback uh, because over the course of a decade, uh, things will uh, work out through the full cycle, I guess. I think... Um, there's definitely a recency bias that people have. And at the moment, uh, Melbourne's had a slightly slower period over the past four years or so, but um, most of these things go round in a circle and most markets have their day in the sun. So I think that's about it uh, for today, Chris. So uh, you should get, get a nice pack on that ankle. Don't hobble around the office too much uh, this week. And we're doing um, a couple of uh, Two Cents Live shows coming up. So keep an eye out for those as well. Um, we'll get... Owen on the chat as well. Always good value. Absolutely, Pete. I hope you enjoy your time over in the UK and you um, start to enjoy the springtime over there. When I was living there back in 27, 2007 to 11, this was a pretty special time of year to be in the UK. Everyone's pretty excited about the summer to come. So enjoy your time over there. It was 22 degrees this week and people are already complaining it's too hot. Uh, some people are never <laughs> happy, but uh, yeah. No end in sight, as they always say in the media. So, um, yeah, hopefully a good season of cricket ahead. Um, so, thanks, Chris. I look forward to chatting again on Two Cents Live. Chat, chat next week, Pete. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more.